Well, welcome everybody to GeoHug. So I'm super excited that we've got Tyler Hall and Alex Mildenberger with us today. Uh, but before we do kick off today's session, I would just like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional lands which are all coming from today. I live on the beautiful lands of the Gadigal of the people of the Agora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. And yes, I'm very excited that we have Tyler Hall and Alex Miltenberger with us today. So Tyler and Alex are geologists and data scientists who have together co-founded Explore Tech, which is a cloud computing software for efficient mineral exploration. And it is going to be brilliant getting their insights into the big problem with AI with a new view on what's next. So they'll be taking us through what it means to mineral exploration, what works, what doesn't, and what to watch out for. So this is going to be a fantastic session. I hope you all enjoy it. And yes, thank you so much, Tyler and Alex, for joining us today. It's wonderful having you. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. No worries. Um, so before we do get stuck into your presentation, I was curious what got you both into mineral exploration to begin with. So I, I don't really know if it was one specific thing. I just always kind of thought that like geology was cool. I really liked uh, hiking and, you know, all the outdoor activities as a kid. And so when I got the opportunity to, to choose what I wanted to do in college, it just seemed like the most interesting thing at the time. And uh, where I went to college at Michigan Tech is a very famous uh, historic mining uh, district. And so just being immersed in that culture for uh, those four years there was uh, really inspiring for me, just seeing all different elements, both the people side and the, the science side was just just awesome. And then uh, for me, it's uh, my family used to work in coal mining. And so I was always sort of familiar with it. And I always liked rocks. Um, and uh, so I knew you could make a good living. And then when I was in college studying geology, I really liked igneous and metamorphic petrology. Um, oh. And so I just Googled geology internship mining and applied literally everywhere I could. Um, and that's how I ended up getting an internship. And then Full time with Freeport and and on and on. The rest is history. So that's yeah. awesome. And so, what have been um some career highlights for you both so far? Well, I really have enjoyed a lot of the research that I've gotten to do. So I got to work with a really great professor at Michigan Tech doing some undergrad research, uh, Snehmoy Chatterjee. So uh, shout out to him for kind of you know guiding me into you know where I am now. And then uh, my PhD research was just an incredible experience. Um, at Stanford. And so that's been a, a big career highlight as well as like just getting to spend, you know, so much time just digging into the nitty gritty details of, of, you know, data science and, and how it relates to geology was super fun. Yeah. Um, and then of course, uh, founding the company over the last year, ExploreTech uh, has been, you know, super challenging, but also, uh, you know, I'd have to highlight that as well. That's brilliant. Yeah, it's um, Explore Tech has been just the best, most rewarding thing that I've done. And so it's just it's just so much fun um, to have started this and be able to share it with you all today and uh, continue on. I love this. And um, yes, yeah, so I always ask the speakers to bring along some of their favorite pet rocks. And I was uh, curious what ones you've brought along for us today yeah so i have well i have a whole bunch of rocks on my desk here but i'll just grab a couple um so these are some of uh my pieces of native copper Ooh. i really love these just because you could find these just sitting on the ground they got pulled up from the the glaciers in um uh, the keweenaw peninsula and they come in all sorts of different forms and they make these really crazy, delicate looking shapes. Um, and if you look really closely, you can see some little pieces of metal just kind of sticking out. So I absolutely love these. This is what got me into, you know, mining and mineral exploration from the start. So they hold a pretty special place for me. That's awesome. And then uh, my rock comes from, uh, this is the best rock that I, I collected while I was working at the Baghdad mine in Arizona. And so this is a diorite. Um, it's very, very mafic and has a uh, uh, a lot of calcopyrite going through it there. And so this was the highest quality sample that I, that I collected and still have. There was a separate one that we collected that we ended up 
that I'm giving to somebody. Um, and that was like a really, it was a condolite specimen. I think you go on mindat.org and you look up condolite from Baghdad. That's the one that oh. uh, my teammate and I collected. But uh, the one that I have right now, it's at the desk right here. So. That's brilliant. That's so cool. Thank you for sharing with us and thank you for joining. It's, um yeah, it's so awesome having you on and I can't wait to hear all your insights. Um, yes, yeah, so if you want to share your screen and we'll we'll get stuck into it. Today, we're going to be talking to you about uh, the big problem with AI, a new view on what's next. Um, and so um, my name is Tyler. I'm joined uh, by Alex. Uh, we both founded Explore Tech in uh, 2023. I'm a geologist and Alex is a geophysicist. Um, and essentially what we're doing um, is we're making it easier to solve complicated, high dimensional, complex um, computing problems, specifically for the mining industry, mineral exploration and, and physical industries. Um, and so Alex and I, uh, we met in graduate school um, and uh, founded Explore Tech shortly after I graduated um, and after Alex had worked in industry for a bit. Um, and so we're going to be talking about AI in terms of what's happening now and today and, and what's going on in the market. And of course, the, the biggest thing to talk about is NVIDIA. Um, and specifically, this company is a $3 trillion market cap company, right? It's huge. It designs um, chips, right? So if I go here and I start this movie, you can see what they design. They design these GPUs and they put them together in such a way to make them more computationally powerful and computationally efficient. Um, and so they design the chips, they manufacture the chips, and the chips are the reasons are the reason that tools like uh, ChatGPT work. And so um, there's three reasons that AI is exploding now, and that everybody knows about ChatGPT. They know about Midjourney. Um, they know about Nvidia. And so there's three reasons why it's exploding now. Number one, um, software is becoming easier and easier to use. So it's very easy to find good software that uses machine learning. So PyTorch is a popular library for AI tools in Python. Uh, and then number two, uh, schools like Stanford, like uh, where Alex and I graduated from, making it very easy to learn the fundamental math, science, and applications to build the tools that people are using. And so it's very easy to spin up something, experiment with it, um, and then learn more about it. And you can go online and take some of these courses. MIT Open Courseware is really, really good. And third, uh, the hardware is becoming a lot more powerful um, and more commonplace thanks to NVIDIA. And so all of these together, um, with a little bit of hype from ChatGPT, which uh, jury's out whether or not it's hype or actually real, um, we're able to apply neural networks in ways that we couldn't before because we didn't have um, the hardware. We didn't have a workforce that really understood what was going on. Uh, the, we, we didn't have commoditized software that made it easy to interact with these tools. And so when we're talking about AI, essentially AI is really good linear algebra. Um, it's linear algebra that's solved using neural networks. Um, and so uh, we see solutions on text, like for ChatGPT, it's trained on a bunch of text and the output is text. Um, we also see solutions on Midjourney, where we generate new pictures given some output. So if you're given, if you input a cat and a moon, um, train it on a cat and a moon, you ask it for a cat and a moon, boom, there you go. Um, we also see some solutions on geology and mining data. Um, and so we'll go into some of those and then go into one specifically later on. And so we'll talk about three large groups. And so the first one is research, um, where we're scanning PDFs, um, and this is, OCR is, is optical character recognition. Um, and so we can summarize the text. We can summarize academic papers, reports, and 43101s. We can find images and we can extract and georeference those images onto a map. And so rather than flipping through pages, maybe really quick. So then there's regional applications, regional exploration applications like hyperspectral mapping or prospectivity mapping. And these essentially, uh, we're trying to determine the probability of a deposit. So we have some threshold um, and it's either no deposit below or, or deposit above. And we'll talk about this a little bit um, in detail uh, soon here. And so last, um, more local applications like XRF scanning, core classification, um, drill targeting. And so in the picture, they've sort of drilled all over this mountaintop. 
Um, and so wouldn't it be nice if they could optimize the drill placement? And so that's what people try and do. They optimize drill placement. And so they try and determine uh, the probability that a uh, resource will be converted into a reserve. And so all three of these have something in common. Um, they have a lot of things in common, but the main thing that we're concerned about them having in common is that they all are approximating probability distributions in order to solve um, some problem. And so why are probability distributions important in geology? Well, main reason here is because we never really know the truth. Um, we can collect all the samples in the world, um, but even past the mine, after mining, in the mill, out at tailings, we still don't exactly know what metal is still at tailings, what metal was extracted. Uncertainty is very, very high in uh, this industry. And so this concept of uncertainty is, is something that we really need to be aware of. And so what I'm showing in this image here is a project that we've done, a uh, collaboration with Rain of Silver, where the ellipsoids are all moving around at depth because we don't exactly know what's underground before we go ahead and drill it. Um, so all of these are called um, realizations of a model, and all are equally likely. They all explain the geophysics at the surface. So there's a lot of uncertainty. It can be moving around a lot down there. And so this uncertainty is associated with three other core aspects. Um, so it's sparse data sets um, where, for example, you have hundreds of kilometers you're exploring, um, but your samples are like hand samples and drill core. Um, so you have that difference in scale. Um, and then when you do collect data, it can mean many different things. So same input, right? the data can be mapped three different ways. So you have three separate maps from the same sample information. That's called a one-to-many relationship. A um, good example of that is like hyperspectral data. Um, and then finally, once we do decide to do something, there's so many possible correct answers, right? So you can drill at 20 different locations at a thousand different depths in a million different ways um, and all sometimes get to the same answer. Um, so there's a lot of possible correct decisions and possible incorrect decisions as well. So um, if we compare these commonly, um, these aspects to those that are common in big tech problems and common to the ones that are being solved with tools like ChatGPT, um, well, ChatGPT is largely trained on data from Reddit or Facebook or YouTube. I mean, it's an overwhelming amount of data, right? Um, and so it's not a sparse data set. It's a very, very rich data set. I know there's cleaning and other issues associated with it, but still a lot of data from there. Um, number two, a picture of a cat is still a, a picture of a cat. There's a one-to-one -one relationship. That is a cat, right? It's not also a dog or also a mouse, um, whereas a single rock can be um, rock type A, rock type B, and rock type C. And that could all be correct. Um, finally, the correct answer is really, really easy in these problems. The goals are very, very well posed. So the answer here is that is a cat. If you're asking me what it is, that is a cat. It's very, very straightforward. And so the big problem in AI is that we're using big tech tools for fundamentally different data environments and then applying them to geology problems, which are fundamentally different problems. So um, mm -hmm. as the old saying goes, uh, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, and so that's what's happening now. We have this machine learning hammer um, and we're using it on all of the problems in geology when in reality, it's it's not a very well uh, formulated problem to be using machine learning. So Alex is gonna go, in, go into a bit of the details on how we actually formulate problems properly um, and then get into an example case um, in terms of, of what I just talked about. Yeah, so... I'll take it over from here. I'll rely on Tyler to uh, switch the sides for me. Um, but basically, uh, the way we see it is that, you know, we think that these tools are very powerful. These, you know, AI tools are very powerful. And we think that they're going to have a significant impact in geology beyond what we see today. Uh, but to realize that future, we really need to be building tools that work for geologists' problems. And so... When I say that, what I mean is taking into account 
all of the relation, the, the, the characteristics of geology data that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, which Tyler described a few slides ago and is just uh, re-shown here. So again, we have sparse data, uh, one-to-many relationships. So you know, one thing can mean multiple different uh, rock types or, or whatever. And then you know, so many possible decisions, how do we actually you know, optimize decisions when there's so many different things we could be doing? And so what we propose to do, uh, we propose this, this general approach is that if we're going to you know, take advantage of these really good AI tools, what we need to be doing is first taking our data sets, accounting for all of these unique complexities and turning them into probability problems. And if we can do that, then the beautiful thing is that we have neural networks and all of these other uh, types of tools, you know, neural networks can mean a whole bunch of different things. There's all a bunch of different architectures and ways to set them up. But fundamentally, these neural networks are really good at solving these probability problems. And so what we are going to talk about in the rest of this talk is kind of what, what it means to have a probability problem in the context of geology. And I think the best way to illustrate that is, is to actually uh, jump into a common example that we see, uh, which is this idea of uh, prospectivity mapping. So Tyler and I have seen this a lot. We've worked on this a lot ourselves. And uh, essentially it's this very simple idea of taking lots of different data that we have uh, and combining that with some sort of samples. You know, These could be drill holes or uh, outcrop samples or soil samples or whatever you want. And we're going to take the data that we know, we're gonna combine it with all of the data layers on top of each other. And we're gonna use that to create maps that tell us you know, where to go to find mineralization or certain geology uh, that we're interested in and so on and so forth. And the value proposition here is super clear, uh, is that we have a whole bunch of data and the AI can go through the data a lot better than uh, we can because we can only hold so many layers in our head. Uh, the challenge here is that it turns out when you actually go to do this, it's super hard. And as we've kind of talked about already, the fundamental reason for this that we see is that we're applying tools that are built for the tech industry uh, to these geology problems. And so the tools that I'm talking about in this case are things like random forests, which are super popular, or neural classifiers. These are just basically neural networks designed for you know classification problems or, or whatever type of problem that you have. And these, again, tools we're dealing, uh, were built to work with massive amounts of data, one-to-one -one relationships and clear goals. And we're applying those to the geology problems where you know, we only have a handful of, of samples. You know, Maybe we've sampled our map really well on the east, but not on the west. That leads to bias. Uh, maybe our layers, our geophysics layers, we might have three different surveys. They don't all line up one-to-one. -one. Um, all of these things create problems that we have to spend a lot of time trying to overcome uh, to get these tools to actually work. And it's not to say that these can't be overcome. There's a lot of work that you can do to overcome a lot of these problems that I'm highlighting on the right here. It's just that this takes a lot of effort and it eventually becomes more of a data curation and cleaning problem uh, that requires some really specialized knowledge about how the statistical methods work under the hood in order to correct for the fact that the tools that we're using weren't built for geology problems. And so uh, what I want to do now is kind of switch to a more you know, concrete example. Everything's been kind of hypothetical so far. So we're just going to show you know, one example of what it looks like to do a mapping project. And so we're gonna use the Grand Canyon here to just illustrate this. And the reason we're using the Grand Canyon is because it's a really well studied area. It's public, it's free uh, data. We don't really have to you know, worry about showing you know, customer data or anything like that, that we've worked on. So we're gonna, just gonna work with the Grand Canyon here. And for those of you not familiar with the geography of the Southwestern US, it's basically, or the, ge the geography of, I guess, the U.S. in general, the Grand Canyon is a, is a really famous, you know, big, deep canyon in, in Arizona, in the southwest part of this, the, the country. Uh, and so what we've done uh, for this example is we've just pretended that, you know, we've never been to the Grand Canyon before. We're going to explore in the black outline on the center. 
and we're going to go drop in and we're going to start looking at some outcrops. And, and let's just say we go here to the sandstone area. We look at the rock. We say, hey, it's sandstone. And then we go over here. We say, oh, hey, look at that rock. That is shale. And so this is kind of simulating what it would look like to go into an underexplored area for the first time, you know, maybe someplace that doesn't have super uh, good geologic maps already, or they're not detailed to the level that they need to be for your exploration goals. And so you go in, we're going to try to create the geological maps uh, with only a, a few uh, outcrop samples, uh, because this is a kind of a common uh, thing that we see uh, in what we do. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to take these samples and we're going to turn this into a probability problem. And so our goal is to create a geologic map off of this, these two samples, right? We only have two outcrops. Can we create a geologic map based on that? So what we can do to take this into a probability problem is to take the satellite data, turn the satellite data that has the red, green, blue bands, and we're going to turn that into a probability distribution. That's the, the background a little bell curve that just represents a probability distribution. Uh, and if that's a distribution, then our sandstone outcrop becomes one sample from that distribution. And then same thing with our shale. Our shale has is another uh, sample. And so the sandstone looks a little more red and the shale looks a little more brown. So those show up on different parts of the distribution. And so that's what we're conceptualizing here. Uh, and so now if we go ahead and we apply these standard kind of big tech tools like a random forest or any other classification algorithm, essentially what that algorithm is going to do is it's going to look at the data and it's going to say, oh, we have two points here. So if I'm going to tell sandstone from shale, I'll just go right in the middle and then anything on the map that looks like sandstone that uh, falls on the left side of this line, we're going to call sandstone. Anything that falls on the right side of the line, we're going to call that shale. And so now we've turned our mapping problem into a machine learning problem. And so once we have this classifier, we can actually go ahead and apply this on the map and actually get a geological map that represents uh, where we're gonna find sandstone and where we're gonna find shale. And so you'll get a picture that looks like this. And it looks pretty cool. You can see some interesting patterns. You can see the drainage basins, you can see you know, the rim of the canyon has this kind of sandstone look to it. Uh, but if we actually investigate this a little bit further, we also see that it's predicting a whole bunch of shale on the, the top right. So the shale is, is the kind of, uh, you know, darker bluish green color. And then the sandstone is like the tannish color. And so we're predicting all the shale up in the, the area that's vegetated. Uh, and then in the middle, it's all speckled. And if we get a 3D view, uh, you can see this pattern uh, I'll, uh, come out a lot more clearly where we have, you know, clearly there's not shale all over the place like is being predicted here. And so what went wrong with this? Essentially, what we've done is we've taken a tool that was built to classify, you know, lots of data that's not, you know, biased, it's, you know, complete. And we've said, hey, tool, random forest, tell me where there's shale and where there's sandstone. And so when we do that, we get a map that just tells you where there's shale and sandstone. Now, what we're gonna propose is there's a better way to come at this problem in a way that accounts for the messiness of the geological data. And so instead of asking the problem, asking the question, where's their shale and where's their sandstone, we're gonna state the goal a little bit differently. We're gonna say, just find me things that look like my outcrops. Just find me the patterns, tell me everything that looks like this outcrop or this outcrop. And so what happens if we come at it from the statement on the right? It's a subtle difference, but it ends up being pretty significant. And so let's just go back to our problem. The way we handled it before was we said, Here's uh, you know, one sample of sandstone and one sample of shale. Now what we're gonna do is instead of just putting a classifier right down the middle, we're going to give these distributions. And so this becomes a different type of classifier. This is all based on uh, distributions. And so we turn that, those samples into little mini distributions 
And what that does is it gives us a shale category, a sandstone category, but it also gives us the ability to discern this other category, which ends up being super important and not something you can do with traditional um, approaches to the classification. And the way we solve this in practice is essentially using neural networks or AI to represent each of these different distributions. And so when you do it this way, you get a much different map when you actually run and do the predictions. So when you do it this way, uh, you get a, a map that actually fills in in a geologically realistic way. And so what you see here is now, instead of having shale everywhere, the shale is confined, confined to the center of the, the, the drainage basin here. So the shale is, is really deep, is, is the deeper part of the, the sequence stratigraphy here. And the um, sandstone is on top. And so if we go to a 3D view, you can see the same sort of pattern a lot clearer as well. And so we can see now we're really pulling out some of the geological structures here. And it's because we're doing this in a way where we don't have, where we don't force the algorithm or the machine to classify things that it has never seen before. And uh, just to put these two side by side, uh, really the point that we want to make here is that um, solving the right problem makes all of the difference when you're working with geological uh, data sets uh, like we do as uh, geoscientists on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's not to say that there's no value in, in a random forest for any use case. That's not what we're trying to say. What we really are trying to say is that in situations where the random forest wasn't built to handle, like if you only have two outcrops, you need a different approach. And that different approach can have a lot of benefits. And so this is, again, the comparison between uh, the two different approaches and how that manifests in a completely different uh, geological map. And so what we really care about um, at ExploreTech is uh, building things like the right-hand side that enable us to ask these different questions and actually be able to process the data in a way where we can make sense of things uh, in a different way that lines up with how we operate as geologists. Um, so I'm going to stop there and turn it back over to Tyler, who's going to zoom out and kind of explain how all of this uh, fits back to the bigger picture. Yeah, thanks. And so um, so if we formulate these problems correctly, um, what do we end up unlocking? Um, and so uh, I'm going to talk about three different types of problems um, that we've been solving. The first one is on mapping. Um, so map updating becomes way faster um, and, and way more accurate as well, as we had just seen, um, because now you can send your geologists to a place where you don't necessarily know what the rock type is. They can go to those transparent sections on the map and collect samples there if they're uncertain about them. And then second, we've been generating drill plans real time and sequences of those uh, drillables. And third, um, and probably one that uh, that Alex likes a lot from a geophysics perspective is, is we've unlocked a way to bake in geology from the start of a geophysical inversion, which solves a really big problem for interpretability. But, but there is a trade-off and that trade-off is compute time. And so here I'm showing you the compute time on a typical laptop for the random forest result from before. Um, and here is the compute time for Mapper, way more than random forests on a standard laptop computer. And so the idea is to reduce this amount of time with uh, cloud computing, right? And so if we can efficiently and optimally distribute cloud computing to solve these problems, we can unlock um, scaling a lot of these technologies much more rapidly. And so we're already seeing hits from Apple and, and other companies who are working on similar problems, very, very basic, but they're making it much easier to interact with um, their uh, products with um, computation. And so here, what I'm showing you a video of is that the person writes on their iPad an equation, um, and then they see a graph. And the result in the graph is given all of the variables that um, they wrote above. And so this graph is coming from all of these variables here. Now, the cool part is that 
Now what they can do is they can press and hold on one of the variables and then up pops a slider and they can slide that variable. And as they slide that variable, they can see down on the bottom right, the graph be modified with that new um, uh, value that they're assigning with that slider. And so they see that updating in real time, right? Now, imagine if we had that capability to update in real time our maps, our drill plans, geophysical inversions, um, operational, like all, all of these very interesting problems start to be solved. And so for geophysics, for inversions, things would be a lot easier to understand because you can interact with them. Um, so you could automate data processing, you could perform geophysical uh, survey optimization live, uh, and that leads to autonomous drone geophysics. Um, and so uh, for operations, um, scenario analysis. Um, so for example, I'll just start this video here. Just an interesting uh, video online for, for a sensor. It's not necessarily showing uh, much here. It's just a cool video. But essentially, all of this data needs to drive some decision somewhere. And the computational infrastructure for making rapid decisions doesn't necessarily exist yet. Um, and so that's what we're excited about building. And so what that unlocks is rapid scenario planning, reagents and grind optimization, multi-scenario failure anal analysis, right? And so, for example, rerouting in seconds, um, communicating uh, with the mill to modify reagents or grind optimization or otherwise as material changes in the pit. Um, and so for geochemistry, this video is from Garasio, which is, uh, this is just a fantastic video I'd like to watch. Um, we'll be able to see in real time updates to geological maps and models um, and be able to remove that black box and make them interactive, right? And so right now you can run compute and get a result pretty rapidly, right? Um, technology exists so that you can make a, um, you can make a resource model pretty quick, but what if you want to make a thousand of them so that you can move your finger over a variable and say, oh, what if I use this cutoff to that cutoff, not necessarily relying on a grade tonnage curve, specifically that one plot, but seeing it in real time and watching it update in real time. So for project evaluation and due diligence, that interaction experimentation becomes even more powerful. Um, and so this isn't a, a mining um, demonstration, but this is a clip from Palantir. And so how they're able to interact with a military data set in real time to be able to plot up roads in real time. It's not just they're pulling up map layers. Um, they're performing these analyses through chat in real time and determining the optimal routing of a truck with um, uh, soldiers to some location. So the only way that we'll be able to develop technologies like this in the future is if we formulate the problems correctly and then efficiently apply um, the fastest computers in the world. Um, so um, that's what we're doing at Explore Tech. So we're bridging this cloud compute we're bringing it to the physical world um, and we're bringing AI, building it all together, right? So all three of these problems can help us operate more efficiently. Um, so yeah, um, thanks for your time. Thank you for, uh, for uh, Jessica, for having us. Um, this has uh, been fantastic. It's great to join you on GeoHub. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was, um, that was awesome. So thank you so much for sharing that with us.